Hi, thanks for tuning in to First Chapter Friday. This week I'm going to read the first two chapters of Clues to the Universe by Christina Lee. Um, you'll see why it's the first two chapters in just a moment. Here is the information from the front flap of the book. This again is Clues to the Universe by Christina Lee and it is published by Quill Tree Books. On the surface, Rosalind Ling Garrity and Benjamin Burns are completely different. Aspiring rocket scientist Ro normally has a plan for everything, yet she's reeling from her dad's unexpected death and all she has left of him is a half-built model rocket and a crater-sized grief that she doesn't know how to cope with. Uh, artist Benji loves superheroes and comic books. In fact, he's convinced his long-lost dad, who walked out on his family years ago, created his favorite comic book series, Spacebound, but has no way to reach him. Ro and Benji were only supposed to be science class partners, but when a mix-up turns the unlikely pair into friends, Benji helps Ro build her rocket, and Ro helps Benji search through his comics and across the country to find out where his dad truly could be. As the two face bullying, grief, and their own differences, Benji and Ro try to piece together clues to some of the biggest questions in the universe. Here is chapter one, Ro. The last time I watched a rocket launch, I learned that there is no sound in space. Over the tinny sounds of the TV, it had sounded, sounded like someone was ripping a sheet of paper right next to my ear but I knew that to the people standing there wearing soundproof earmuffs with their t-shirts and sandals, it was louder than that. I tried to think of the loudest things I knew, the washing machines at the laundromat on the corner of the street near my dad's favorite be breakfast place, my neighbor's lawnmower that growled to life every Saturday morning, the firecrackers that the kids down the street set off on the 4th of July, starting a chain of events that led to a crew of wailing fire trucks and a furious army of neighborhood moms all swarming around one of the kids' porches, in that order. But none of that compared to the space shuttle. I knew how big it was, a quarter million pounds and 184 feet long. 184 feet equaled almost 37 rows if you lined me all up from head to toe. Or almost but not quite 31 dads since he was six feet tall. It was like hurling a big building into the sky, except the shuttle was even larger than the biggest building I'd ever seen. So last November 11th, when I made myself a bowl of Cocoa Puffs and sat in my living room, I watched the Columbia launch into the air with clouds of fire and smoke, loud enough that the people watching who seemed like tiny ants compared to the Columbia, clapped their hands over their fuzzy earmuffs and stared on in awe. As I spooned bites of soggy cereal into my mouth and wondered aloud if the rocket was loud enough to be heard from the moon, Dad replied that no, sound didn't exist in outer space, or on the moon for that matter. What I've learned since then is that there is no sound in space because outer space is made of a big, great big nothing. A vacuum. But here, sounds consist of little tiny invisible sound particles bumping into each other until they reach someone's ear, like the people at the grocery store or in a busy train station. Or like the kids in the hallways of my new school with its narrow hallways and too many windows bumping from friend to friend until they reached their classroom. As I glanced through the window of the library door of that new school with its shiny stacks of books and its buzzing crowds of students, I didn't know who I'd, who'd gathered around the small TV on a cart to watch the launch. I wanted, what kind of, I wanted that kind of silence. I had done my speaking for the day, mostly to tell the school secretary who wore purple lipstick and stared at me through beady eyes that I was the new student at Roosevelt Middle School and to tell mom, who was nervously chewing her piece of mint gum and twisting the ring around her finger and wearing her fancy realtor jacket when she hugged me tight, that yes, mom, I would be all right at my first day there. All I wanted to do right now was sit in the library and count to 10 or 100. Today was August 30th. It had been 276 days since the last time I watched a rocket launch and I was now three minutes late for my next class. 
It had been 276 days since I last sat down with Dad hugging a bowl of Cocoa Puffs in front of the TV and decided that I too would build a rocket. And what I now thought about was the half-built rocket sitting in the closet of my bedroom and how Dad would never be here to watch a shuttle launch with me again. Chapter 2. Benji. Aliens were real. I was sure of that. What was harder to figure out was how to prove it to Amir when he was all the way across the country. It had been way easier when he was here. I'd practically memorized the bike path to his house with its chipped white paint and the rusted iron weather vane and all the weird garden gnomes that the previous owner had left behind. Two days before the Kamari family stuffed every last blanket, picture frame, and silverware set into their Ford station wagon and bundled up their living room rug. I biked over for the last time, and Amir's mom let me have some gas they'd been saving up. We'd settled on the front steps of his porch. I bit into the sticky Persian candy, running my tongue over the pistachio nougat. I whipped out a folded newspaper article from my pocket. It had crinkled to the shape of my jeans, but I smoothed it out. UFO sighting in Cleveland by teenagers. Likely some prank, Amir said. They're they probably made it up to get some attention. But what if it's real, I pressed. Something like this was in the New York Times a couple of years ago. Mom read that every Sunday morning, if only to skim the news to do the crosswords, which, said, which she said calmed her. In Berkeley, too, Amir shrugged, polishing off his gauze. Maybe it's a Russian conspiracy. Come on, I said, holding up the half-eaten candy. Think about it. What if aliens came here? They've probably never tried something like this before. A lot of people haven't tried it, Amir said. There are probably two Iranian families in all of Sacramento. Or red vines, I said. And what if they haven't seen trees before? Do you think they'll know how to talk to humans? Wouldn't that be a little far-fetched? Not in Spacebound. Amir met my eyes and grinned. I can't believe you, I got you hooked on those comics. I mean, it's not a bad story, and I really want to know what happens to that spaceship. Amir stood up. If a new spacebound issue comes out, send it to me, all right? Just in case I can't get it in New Haven. On it, I stuffed the newspaper back in my pocket. I'll send you some red vines, too. I'll put together a survival package. Amir laughed. Sounds good, Ben Franklin. Amir liked to call me Ben Franklin, mostly because Benjamin Franklin was his favorite American historical figure, and I was the only other Benjamin Amir knew. There wasn't any other re resemblance. I mean, Benjamin Franklin, founding father of our country, Benjamin Burns, founder of our school's two-person art club, down to one person now that the other member was moving to New Haven, Connecticut. No matter how many times Amir had pointed out New Haven on a map, telling me to memorize its latitude and longitude, or explained that that was where Yale was, a fancy college with a hospital where his baba had just gotten a job, I couldn't picture this place. Amir had, Amir had said it was in the Ivy League, and I didn't really know what that meant either. Maybe there was a lot of ivy there? I could already imagine it as the cover of a comic monstrous ivy vines snaking across a city. Evil plant-like creature attacks a small town. Who will save the civilians? A character emerges from the roots. Okay, maybe New Haven wasn't like that, but it was far for sure. Really, really far, as in approximately 2,800 miles of biking distance. Send me some comics anyway, Amir said, and tell me if a UFO comes too. I grinned. Of course I will. Now, on the first day of school, I stared down at the letter I was writing. Things really had been so much easier with Amir around. If there were an alternate universe in which Dr. Kar Karimi hadn't moved his family all the way across the country, Amir would have been here making science class more fun, or at least bearable. Instead, I had to overhear... Over here, Drew Balanick and his friends bragging loudly about setting off fireworks on the 4th of July. It was neat, Drew was saying, until that old guy volts down the street came out and went totally ballistic. I've heard he's like that, though, one of Drew's friends said. Volts is a total spaz. People say he has fit sometimes and that he doesn't like people. 
Jenny tried to shoplift at his store once and he caught her and now she won't even go near that block. I gritted my teeth and sketched an alien in the corner of the paper as the teacher started calling attendance. Benjamin Burns? I looked up at Mr. Devlin, wondering whether to collect him or to correct him or not. They called him Toothpick because he resembled one with narrow long legs and a seemingly even longer face. His head was smooth and shiny like a gumball. I cleared my throat. <clears throat> Benji, I croaked out just as the classroom door slammed shut, slammed open. A girl in a faded blue and white windbreaker came into the room. Drew Balanick and his firework launching friends in the back went silent for a moment to stare. One of them snickered and then turned it into a weak cough. Drew raised his eyebrows and leaned in to whisper to one of his friends. I had honestly, positively never seen her before in my life. She brushed frizzy, frizzy hair back from her face, scanned the class with a wide-eyed stare, and then walked straight to the only open seat in the class, which happened to be the other seat at my table. She didn't say a word. Toothpick looked back at the class as if nothing happened. Benjamin Burns? Here, I mumbled. I turned back to my drawing. As Toothpick went over things about labs and goggles and safety precautions, I pulled out the latest spacebound issue and copied one of the planets so the alien would be sitting on something. While I was trying to sneak colored pencils under my notebook, I saw how the new girl was stacking notebooks on one on top of another, reorganizing her folders and then reshuffling them. Instead of a bracelet, she wore a huge black watch. It looked out of, a, out of place on her wrist. I began drawing freckles on the alien face. What I hadn't realized when I reached up to sneak another colored pencil was that the new girl had carefully placed an open thermos right next to my elbow. I knocked it over, the full metal bottle making a dull thud on the table. Water spilled everywhere. I grabbed the letter out of the puddle and I pushed my folder and notebook to the floor making an even bigger mess. Heads turned, two colored pencils bounced on the floor. Toothpick stopped talking. The new girl stared at the mess. I swear my face was a million degrees. I slunk over to the counter and grabbed a bunch of paper towels and cleaned up the mess. I snuck a glance at the girl. She was lining up my colored pencils in the order of the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. I'm sorry, she burst out. I just didn't. It's fine, I mumbled. We didn't exchange another word for the rest of class. When the bell rang, I scooped up my purple folder and bolted for the door, clutching my half-finished letter and wishing I could just keep drawing freckles on this alien until the day was over. It wasn't until after six more classes, after I was waiting in the school pickup line, that I realized my comic book was missing. Here are some of the reasons to freak out about losing the latest issue of Spacebound. One, Captain Gemma Harris, the main character, was left stranded on the dust-covered planet with her broken spaceship ship after being chased by evil bounty hunters across the galaxy, and I was dying to find out if she and her trusty space pup had escaped. Two, I'd spent 60 cents buying the latest issue of these comics last week, along with another $3 on a cart carton of red vines and stamps to send my letters and I wasn't sure I could afford any more, especially now that Mom cut my allowance down. Three, it was the key to finding my missing dad. All of those reasons, actually, but mostly number three. That's the end of the first two chapters of Clues to the Universe by Christina Lee. I hope you enjoyed it. I know the cat did. Tune in next time for another first chapter Friday from the Alameda Free Library.